Th th thanks, everybody, for being here today. Thank you. It's uh, Sa San Pedro is an interesting, interesting place. I grew up in L.A., and um, historically, there wasn't much of a reason to get down here unless I was taking a shuttle to, you know, to uh, to Catalina or something. Um, but I'll tell you, what's, what's happened down here, and Eric can talk to it in a little bit, is um, the evolution generationally of, of the development here has been altering. $2 billion are going into the region uh, in investment. Um, you're you're going to see a whole refacing of what this looks like, and you're already seeing it. And three of the people that are responsible for that are sitting up on the stage today. And so I just want to thank everybody for being here. We're going to review what's happening in the region, uh, why it's happening, what the economic impact is from what's happening, and also uh, where the opportunities might lie as an investor, or an onlooker, or somebody who um, is interested in participating in some capacity. So uh, I want to introduce uh, the panel in a minute. I want to thank our sponsors and partners, Forbix, Miller Inc., Vectis, uh, Isaia, and um, I know I'm forgetting one. Can somebody read the last uh, logo for me on the... And Urban Stearns, I apologize, and Urban Stearns, Shy and, and Lee. So thank you, everybody, for helping to support what we're doing here. It's a really special location that we're in. Right, so Emil is developing with Urban Stearns this project. It's the largest office to multifamily conversion in the region. Uh, it's going to have 225 units plus another 50,000 feet of 244. 244 plus another. Th <laughs> but who's counting? <laughs> 275,000 feet total. <laughs> but but to give you to give you a sense of scale for a second is. There's 8,500 needed units in San Pedro, and a project of this scale makes that much of a dent. So there's that much needed housing here, which is just interesting to conceptualize, and that's because of so much economic development that's happening here. And so we're in a very unique space, obviously the, the top floor, and what's neat about where we are is you can look out this window and see the developments and projects of the other two gentlemen on the stage, Eric Johnson and Terry Tamanen, where if you look here with the, uh, the tented uh, areas and the dirt, that's the West Harbor project, multi-hundred million dollar project there, and we'll talk about that. And then if you look all the way toward the end with the solar paneling on top, that's Terry's project at Altice and him and his team. So really excited to get this thing going so you can learn a little bit more about what's going on here. So why don't we do a quick round robin and, and introduce ourselves. We can get in some questions. Uh, I'm Emil Karakowski with Forbix. I'm partners with Shai and Lee, Urban Stearns. Uh, we are invested in this project. It's an adaptive reuse property in San Pedro. And uh, excited to be here, excited to host this event, and uh, that's us. Hi, everybody. I'm Eric Johnson. I'm the senior project executive on the West Harbor Project and the president of Jericho Development. We're a local family business. I got my brother here, Alan. Say hello. Hello. <laughs> hello. Um, we used to office in this building on the floor below for 25 years, so it's kind of old home week. Um, and that's probably enough about me. I'm Terry Tamanen, the president and CEO of Altice in the port of Los Angeles here, which you'll hear about later. Uh, I want to also acknowledge one of my board members sitting here on my right and one of the founders, really, of Altice has been here much longer working on this project than I have. Uh, also, we'd be remiss if we didn't recognize Harbor Commissioner Lee Williams right over there. Wave to everybody. Give him a big round of applause. Yes, it's a tough job. And uh, speaking of housing, nobody knows it better than Lee. And I also want to just acknowledge my team, Jenny Crusoe, who's also the real founder of this in the back there. Wave, Jenny. And yes, give her a great big round of applause. And uh, Jade Clemens, who runs our Blue Sea program, which is our business program. So for those of you in business, you might want to talk to Jade. Very nice. I'm David Worth, the founder and CEO of CSQ, C-Suite Media, as the, as the hold co. And we're, we're thankful for everybody to be here today and learn from everybody on this stage. It's pretty compelling what's happening here. So let's, let's ask the question, because we're all in San Pedro. It's south, you know, west LA. Why San Pedro? Very open-ended softball question. Why don't we start with somebody who's been here for how many generations? 
Uh, well, the company's gone on its fourth, and here in Pedro for at least three. Um, I would guess the short answer to the question is that's because um, San Pedro is the surliest community in Los Angeles. <laughs> it's, um, it's really small town living embedded in a major urban environment. You can see we're surrounded by industry and activity, uh, but yet we cling sort of dearly to our sense of self and community. Uh, Alan and I are actually from Palos Verdes, so we never claim San Pedro heritage, but having worked down here for now almost 40 years, right, 30 some odd years, it's our adopted community and we've really found it to be, in spite of being so damn surly, warm and embracing when you stick around long enough to kind of earn some credibility and to deliver on your promises. We're one of the larger landlords on 6th and 7th Street and have been accumulating real estate down here. We founded our business in Long Beach and we came to Pedro, one, because it was so much less expensive 30 years ago. And we thought, any day now, this place is gonna pop. And uh, it's any day now. Terry. Sure, well, uh, I'll just say it's probably an easier answer because being a blue economy, education, workforce training, and business hub, you need to be where the blue is, which is the water. If you're going to be developing aquaculture and uh, wave energy and underwater robotics, uh, you need a great place to, to be. And where does commerce meet the ocean except right here? So it's the perfect place for us. So I've been a lender for 23 years and uh, have lent all over the city of Los Angeles, including San Pedro, Long Beach. And I'm not a trendsetter by any means. I, I let other people do it for 40 years and then I come in when I see a beautiful project on the water slowly come to life. So I've been scouting this location for San Pedro as an area for probably seven years, waiting for the right timing and the right deal. And then when Lee and Shai uh, came in and, and found this property and we were able to figure out to make it work, we jumped right in. And so I think that, you know, this area is very interesting. I think it's very undervalued. And uh, it's hard to say that about the greater Los Angeles. But uh, I do think there's going to be a lot of growth in this area. And um, outside of all the markets I could genuinely say in Los Angeles or in California, I, I wouldn't be anywhere else. The way that San Pedro looks year over year, really last two years to now, is game changing. So let's talk about two years to now and, and what it's going to look like in the next year or two because of all the development that's happening here. So, Terry, you've got a ribbon cutting coming up in a couple of weeks. Tell us a little bit more about what goes on at Altice. $100 million of investment has existed there, but billions of dollars of economic impact over the next decade at minimum. Tell us about what you're excited about and what you guys are up to over the next couple of years there. Well, sure. And thanks for mentioning May 29th at uh, 11 a.m. Please come. Open house for our ribbon cutting, uh, grand opening of Altice, of the remodeled space. For those of you that may not know, those are 110-year-old warehouses, and the Port of Los Angeles dedicated that site at significantly reduced rent to us as long as we bring the education, the workforce training, and as I mentioned, importantly, the research and the businesses, the blue economy businesses, and use it for that. And of course, as long as we raise the money to do the renovation, which we have, and we're still in fundraising mode. If anybody wants to contribute, we've got more space that we need to renovate. But you'll see the 180,000 square feet of historic warehouses that uh, that have been renovated if you come on May 29th. And, and at any time, we have open houses, you can sign up on our website and so forth. But um, uh, the thing that excites me is to remember that as we look at our environmental and sustainability challenges and clean air and so forth, it's really, we look to the land. Everybody thinks about solar panels on a rooftop or wind turbines in the desert or electric cars that you plug in, when in fact, 70% of the planet is covered by ocean, not land. And so we have to increasingly get our sustainability solutions from the ocean, starting by restoring it. And that's why we talk about regenerative aquaculture, things that harvest food and fuel, pharmaceuticals and other great things from the ocean, but in a sustainable, regenerative way so we can restore its productivity and restore it to health because 
our life really depends on the quality of the ocean, everything from our weather and wind patterns to our food and fuel and, and future water. So in, in, Innovation Hub, Business Growth Center, um, one of a very few uh, around the world. You've heard, of, you've heard of green tech, but and there's plenty of green tech facilities and, and accelerators, but, but blue tech is a lot rarer, and so we're very fortunate to have one of those facilities here in LA, especially considering the economic impact that it promises over the next X amount of years. Eric, is you're building uh, an incredible waterfront facility here, hundreds of millions of dollars in development, retail, uh, restaurant, entertainment, I mean, you, you name it. We want to give us some insights as far as that project, how long did it take to even get you know, entitled and, and um, you know, what was the timeline of that? And then, hey, let's, we're looking forward to opening in the next year or two. So give us an update. I thought you said we only had 10 minutes. <laughs> uh, no, thanks. Uh, let's see, we got selected. We applied for the opportunity about 12 years ago, and I believe we got selected uh, through a competitive process that was run by the port a little over a decade ago, and have been actually working really hard on it ever since. One of the through lines between Terry's project and ours, um, important through line is is the partnership with the Port of Los Angeles. You know, when you you know asked me the first question, I kind of gave a flippant answer. Those of you who know me, that's totally in, in, in character. But really, what we've got here is water, right? It's an irreplaceable resource. And over the last 20 years, the ports figured out how to engage with the community and provide opportunities, not just to be a world leader in, in cargo and economic growth for the region, but also in its relationship with the community, how to give back. We were really blessed with the opportunity to pick up uh, a treasured commercial resource. Uh, when we got the project, it was called Ports of Call. Alan and I remember when it was built, it used to come down here as when we were in elementary school, and it was this amazing sense of pride that was developed within the San Pedro community. We attracted regional, extra regional, international travelers. Um, and people often ask me, well, how did you, you know, how would you, how do you know it's going to work in San Pedro? And, and the answer has been, we've seen it done. Um, the original development, you know, wasn't maintained very well. The, the term of the lease didn't really allow for extensions. Those things were all rectified as we went through the process with the port and uh, what followed. So the entitlements were kicked off in 2009 by the Port of Los Angeles doing a program level EIR from the bridge to the breakwater. Um, really important, necessary work. We then took that framework, did an addendum in 2017, 2016-17 when we uh, achieved our lease and were able to take that entitlement, which was for 375,000 square feet of new improvements, and run with it. What you see out they're in the buildings that are built, the white steel tents, if you want to call them tents, I prefer pre-engineered metal building, but that's just me, um, is about 70,000 square feet. When we're built out with our three primary buildings, we'll be a little over 200,000 square feet, and then we have plans for future hospitality work at the very north end uh, once we get through the process. Um, kind of our vision, if you will, is to reflect San Pedro, if you will, and, and its, its ethos in the built environment. So for me personally, there's sort of three, three key elements that every piece of the project needs to have. It needs to be unique, it needs to be authentic, and it needs to be fun. And we're really blessed having the opportunity to take advantage of the authenticity, right? You couldn't hide that industrial port that's behind us. And we wouldn't want to. In fact, we embraced it. And it becomes the context. I call it industrial theater. But where else are you going to go, sit on a nice overwater deck, have a beer, and watch a couple hundred foot tall container ship glide silently by? It's 
something we in the community somewhat take for granted, but the more we show the site, bring people out, it's been a key driver for our leasing activity. And really what makes the project work is not so much us, but it's the uh, curation of the tenants and the ecosystem we're building for food and beverage, for retail, and a huge entertainment component, including a 6,200-person amphitheater that we're in the process of doing a supplemental EIR to expand the 500-seat amphitheater, which was in the original EIR. So really those third-party players, if you will, have validated the, the, the entire concept, and then the final validation came in when we were able to actually borrow money to build it. Uh, we, we were the largest ground-up um, commercial retail development finance during COVID in the U.S., so it's we're, we're proud of that. I think San Pedro should be proud of that. It was wasn't pleasant. You looked at me funny, like we didn't make a loan. No, I, I, I didn't know you then. It would have been <laughs> much more fun. A third tenant. All right. So you've got you've got business innovation. You have retail, recreation, hospitality. You need a place for people to live, right, and come hang, and so um, so they can go hang. So. So tell us about the residential landscape here, your thoughts around the importance of multifamily, but also, look, this is a, this is a big project, converting an office building. I, I'm sure most of us want to learn a little bit more about what that takes. Um, we've probably all heard how challenging that it is, so why don't you kind of clue us in on that and the economics and, and kind of decision-making behind, behind that, yeah. You have to be a little bit crazy to get into it, right. just the way it works, and I think we, we hit up all the right headlines. I mean, I think, you know, this partnership, uh, especially as a family, you've been doing this since 2009, and uh, it's being calm, persevering, seeing the finish line, and, and getting to it, right? And I think, uh, piggybacking of what was said earlier, there has to be enough ingredients in the soup to want to do a deal. And I think this building makes a lot of headlines. Uh, it's an office building. It's adaptive reuse. It's in an opportunity zone. So there's a lot of things that made sense about this for us, and... And it's also partnerships, right? So when we first were approached about doing this deal, this is our third adaptive reuse project. So uh, we have made lots of mistakes. And that's how you learn, right? So after gutting this thing or engineering it in an Excel spreadsheet, I, I don't know how to build anything really. And uh, we decided to do it. And um, it, all the right things had to line up to make this thing work. We were exiting in a deal. We created an opportunity zone fund. We mostly seeded it with our own capital. And now... You know, 12 months later, over there you see two big, I don't know what they're called, Rendering. renderings that will show what the project will look like when we begin. So hopefully, at least should I say a date? I'm afraid to say it. <laughs> I won't. <laughs> hopefully soon. <laughs> walk, us, walk, us through, walk us through a little bit of what it's going to take from here to get to point of completion. It's going to take a loan. <laughs> it's going to take a lot of project management. It's going to take us getting to permits, hopefully, in the, soon. And uh, at that point, uh, this is a long-term play for us. It's an opportunity zone investment. Uh, and the most important part about this deal is the area. Uh, you know, there's a lot of work that's gone in into redeveloping this area. We're excited about seeing it. Uh, you know, Ron and I have been looking at deals here. Ron is my partner. Jen's my partner. Uh, wave. <clears throat> and so... You know, we've, we've been on the lending side, we've been on the investment side, and it, it has to be perfect for us to want to do a deal. Uh, no real estate deal is perfect, but it was perfect enough. And I think for, for us, give me the question again. We just... what's, it, what's, it what's it look like from here to point of completion? Oh, a long, a, a long, whichever way you want to take tangent. it. Yeah, it's a long and arduous road. I think what it's going to take from this point is all of us buckling down, rolling up our sleeves, and uh, putting in a bunch of cash into this thing and seeing it to the finish line. And then we're going to see it grow over the period of 10 years and then maybe keep it, maybe sell it. So it really just depends. But, you know, we strongly believe in the area. We think we see the right fundamentals. We love this project that's going to come to life in 12 months, right as we, you know, are hopefully midway through our construction. This will be a 244-unit apartment building. There's 600 parking next door that we don't have to build. There's going to be hopefully an amazing curated retail on the first floor of this building. And so we're excited about seeing it come to life and uh, partner up with people in the area and, and see it grow and uh, be a part of the process. Yeah. 
No, I love that. Uh, let's let's talk a little bit about the real estate environment in general right now, because I think that's on a lot of people's minds. Listened to a great global panel yesterday at a conference in LA. Um, are you finding any resistance in the marketplace? And if so, obviously, what are those? And do you have any foresight in the next 12 to 24 months that things will ease and get a little little more, um, I guess, to use the word ease again, will get a little easier out there to get deals done or, or make progress? Well, everybody knows what's going on, right? So rates are high. They're still not coming down. Inflation is not really under control. And so every time we think rates will drop in six months, we keep saying six months every six months. And so until the rates come down, you're going to see less transactions, deals of pencil more, that are more difficult to pencil. So you're kind of getting squeezed from both sides. Uh, right now, frankly, you know, we launched the, the, the Forbix Income Fund because fixed income investments sometimes make you more money than equity investments for the time being. Obviously, when rates drop, those yields will drop as well. And so a lot of people are flocking to debt instead of equity. And so you're getting squeezed on the equity side, unless potentially you have another reason to invest, like an opportunity zone. You know. <clears throat> and then from the other perspective, lenders are still not lending. You know, or they are lending, but the interest rates are high. Things don't debt service. So you're kind of, you know, what is it, burning the candle from both ends? Yeah. Uh, and so it's difficult. Will it ease up? Of course. Anything that goes up comes down. Anything that comes down goes up. And so hopefully in uh, 12 months, rates are lower, things are easier. But I think even between last year and this year, you see a fundamental shift in investor sentiment. So last six months of last year, everyone was on the sidelines. As of January and February, people woke up and said, well, it ain't changing. We're going to do something. So people start investing, finding opportunities, and they're still out there. Just have to look hard. Eric? Well, I think... From my like personal perspective, just looking at our portfolio and deals, obviously office is a really challenged market and environment, and um, we're pleased to see people coming to the area. The multifamily development here has really been outstanding, unprecedented in San Pedro's history, certainly for people living ab above, you know, second stories. That's pretty unique and the numbers are amazing projects like yours are really we think the future I mean for years I really wanted more mid you know midday midweek office we as I mentioned we officed here for a long time it's it's a challenging market um, so we appreciate where you're taking off or taking on in the way of adaptive reuse into a multifamily market that's a, at least cooled if not you know stabilized um, Retail, on the other hand, we were just like the redheaded stepchild ten years ago, getting worse. Right? Is there? How can you make? A, a, how can you make a huge investment in retail? How can you raise the capital to do that? Um, and the key is good partners who get that this isn't retail. It's not a mall. It's not, and we're not a REIT. That's the other thing. You have to size up the development partner with the opportunity and get it for what it is. It's a one-off. It's something that you're not going to replicate, and it's not built for people who are driven by quarterly numbers. We're 10 years in. It's all money out. Well, we are getting some rent and parking. My brother's driving the parking. We're doing pretty well there. But I guess from my perspective, it's been kind of fortunate in the sense that the retail marketplace for things like we're doing is actually looking better than it has and is on an upward trend. And uh, so we're really pleased to see that. And yeah, I'm waiting for interest rates to start dropping like for, everybody else. From a retail standpoint, there's $1.5 million of economic activity every time they, a cruise ship lets off here in the port. Is that right? Okay. So that's got to be pretty substantial for the local retail community. How have you seen the cruise business and the cruise line? Obviously, during COVID, was extremely challenged, but <clears throat> kind of back on the upswing. How, how do you see that impacting your future retail and retail for the area? Well, the cruise business is a, a, an incredibly important potential driver. Historically, it's not been that. The cruise passengers aren't historically spending much time in downtown San Pedro or in the community broadly. And 
the cruise operators didn't necessarily want their brand, you know, associated with and juxtaposed to what we're redeveloping. Um, that said, with the expansion and the RFP Lee that I understand is going out for the outer cruise terminal, uh, we've seen three or four ships added in the last couple of years, and the traffic is noticeable. I'm talking not regularly, but certainly on a regular basis with um, the people who are going to be proposing looking at establishing this as a much more regional cruise destination with many more itineraries than currently exist here. Um, you know, bringing people from far away is, you know, we're in a crowded marketplace. To, to get attention in Los Angeles, you have to be big and loud. And fortunately, San Pedro is all of those things. People just don't, don't know it yet. So I'm, I'm really, we expect to, this project, however, to be really adopted like the old Ports of Call was by the local community, local regional community, and that's our sustaining book of business. And, and our challenge, if you will, is to be relevant seven days a week, all day long. Um, and I think we do that by taking advantage of the physical aspects of what we were fortunate enough to be given the opportunity to develop and by the people that we put there in the, in the way of offering goods and services and, and as much as anything, experiences. That's kind of experiential. It is an inherently an experiential place and we're just working hard to leverage that. And I diverged quite a bit from your question, but that's just how it goes sometimes. All good. All good. And we all love the boating community. I mean, is there anybody in this room that doesn't like to spend a little bit of time on a boat? Right. A little seasick, maybe? Okay. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> most, most of us do. So creating this kind of boating culture here, or, or let's call it advancing it here in the region with your development and um, there's the advancement overall is something I think is pretty compelling and something that's rare and unique and, um, you know, worthy of creating a more, a bigger, louder voice box around because that's a, it's a rare opportunity. I think we need social media followers. Is that what it is? Yeah. Social TikTok? TikTok. That? That, Terry, I, Terry, who's... I'm ignorant of those things. Who's... Uh, good, that's... Yes, you sleep better at night <laughs> because of it, believe me. So, Terry, tell, tell it... Look, big economic driver, um, you know, end of, end of the, uh, the port here. What... Who, who are your tenants? Where are they coming from? Just so we know, kind of get a sense of the business community here and where they're being driven from. Sure. And, and let me just emphasize how important what you just heard from these two guys is to that answer that question. Because, for example, University of Southern California already has several labs here and wants to expand their footprint. UCLA, as you probably know, just bought a campus on Palos Verdes and they have student housing that they own in Pedro, but they don't have any lab space. So they need lab space at Alta C for their wet labs and marine biology programs and so on. But uh, when you think about if you're faculty and you're trying to get them to come down the 110 from you know, UCLA, from Westwood, or, or the campus at USC, it's hard to get faculty to relocate down here or even just come down here on a daily basis uh, to, to work. It's hard to get students unless it's attractive, unless it's a really vibrant place. And so uh, I can't emphasize enough how important our partners on the stage here are in making that happen. Um, you know, sure, if you are a blue economy business, let's say you've got uh, a wave technology that you want to demonstrate and there's just nowhere else you can do it in Los Angeles, you're going to come no matter how far you have to commute. But we want to make this an attractive place for students uh, and the research labs that are spinning out the IP. So, for example, and to answer your question, um, actually, Nina Nushin is right here. Uh, raise your hand, Nina. She's with our kelp lab from the University of Southern California and a nonprofit called Alta Seeds that is doing the most groundbreaking work worldwide on algae. Giant kelp, as you know from offshore in Los Angeles here, is, is an algae. It's one of the most remarkable plants on the planet. It grows as much as two feet a day. Uh, it used to be a huge economic driver. There was a company called Kelco that was based out of uh, San Diego that uh, used to just go and clip the tops of the existing kelp beds there. They had kind of a floating lawnmower that would go back and forth and harvest uh, that. And then, of course, by the time they'd come back around to the beginning, it had grown back up. And they just keep doing that. 
And during World War II, they were making gunpowder out of kelp. Uh, today, if any of you brushed your teeth, you used kelp, carrageenan. Uh, it's an extract from kelp. There's now, thanks to the research that uh, Nina and, uh, and Sergey are doing at, on our site, there's new exciting products in terms of pharmaceuticals, industrial colorants. I had no idea how much industrial colorants, when you get a, 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 any kind of a, of a plastic or, or metal object that's been painted in some way, those are industrial colorants that are often toxic petroleum-based dyes. Well, now that can all be sourced from kelp in biodegradable, sustainable ways. Uh, there's a, a company that is extracting an ingredient from another algae to make a gluten-free, low glycemic index baking flour. So you can have baked goods that are not only gluten-free, but are low in sugar, which is important to a growing number of us that are getting fatter and pre-diabetic and things like that. Uh, so there's that amazing biology that's going on with researchers and the students. And many of this is coming from the PhD students. You want to attract them. You want to keep them here and make them excited to come to work. And, uh, and then, of course, the IP that gets spun out to these companies that are then developing that. Um, and then, as I mentioned, we've got, uh, uh, we have a coalition of about 30 wave and tidal energy companies that we helped pass uh, Senate Bill 605 last year in Sacramento to incentivize wave and tidal energy all up and down the state. And so now those companies are able to locate here and demonstrate their technology and then find utilities and other end users to harvest that abundant, uh, almost limitless source of clean energy. And there's a lot of innovation going on in that sector. For example, you may have heard that there's going to be offshore wind farms off of California in the near future. Well, in other parts of the world where they build wind farms, they're stick built uh, on basically on giant platforms like oil platforms and then the wind turbine. Well, our water here is too deep. So they're going to have to be floating wind turbine platforms and they'll be anchored to the bottom, you know, anchored with you know cable and chains to a, a, a concrete infrastructure. There's a company at Alta Sea called RCAM, R-C-A-M, that has huge 3D concrete printers. They actually print three-dimensional in concrete, and they can build up these uh, giant infrastructures that are heavy enough to hold the floating wind turbine in place, but then it's hollow. So you can use the wind energy to pump water out of this hollow vessel that's down at the bottom of the ocean, and when you want the energy on land, you let the pressure of the ocean pushing back in the water, spinning the turbine, and that sends the electricity to shore. So you have intermittent renewables, because the wind doesn't blow predictably all the time, intermittent renewables, that energy stored without a battery. And the same thing with a company called EcoWave that's on our site. They build floats that, that are mounted to existing breakwaters and jetties, so you don't have to build new infrastructure. Every harbor, every... Uh, uh, it, uh, coastal infrastructure has waves and jet or uh, breakwaters and jetties to absorb waves. So instead of just losing those waves, you you mount floats that go up and down from those jetties and breakwaters. That generates energy, but it's basically going up and down like a bicycle pump. So it's creating a pressure. That pressure is accumulated in a tank on land, and when you want the electricity, you let the pressure out of the tank and it spins a turbine. And once again, you have intermittent renewables stored without a battery, so it makes those renewables cheaper, more efficient. All of that is going on right at Alta Sea today. Very exciting new technologies harnessing these, these new blue economy uh, and blue biology opportunities. You look, <clears throat> when you look at the template for success in a region, right, it's not often that you find an area that is as mature as San Pedro, but is so young in its evolution in adding these pieces to the recipe or the ingredients that make an area so successful and dynamic. And so you've got tourism, you have business development and innovation, you have retail, shopping, entertainment multifamily of the university system. So I'm, I'm probably missing a few, but you, you get the point where one of the reasons we wanted to anchor an event here is because we did see the opportunity. All of these folks on stage saw the opportunity. It's pretty darn compelling. And it's in our, it's in our region. It's, you know, down the freeway, essentially, and it's still in the same county. So pretty, pretty wild. Is there, where are the, I mean, you all have your unique projects and properties. Where do you see the opportunity within your projects and maybe outside of your projects to continue to invest and help grow the region? Gentlemen? 
That's an excellent question. Bueller? Yes. Well, I, I really think as you look at San Pedro broadly, it's had this weird, almost otherworldly dichotomy for years, and that's that the real property got less valuable the closer you got to the water. Like, yeah, right? Nobody believes me now, but because <laughs> that wasn't always the case. Um, so part of it is taking uh, advantage of that dynamic. So historically, the people who worked in the port, as they became successful, they moved up the hill to get away from the smell and the smoke and the industrial activity from which they derived their wealth. Um, so that kind of pushed the community stratification that existed. Um, as I mentioned earlier, with all the work that the port's done over really the last 20 years to clean up the water, move all the industrial uses across the main channel onto Terminal Island, has really freed up. It's like this rising tide that just lifted the value of the real property and its perception in the community. So we're really kind of riding that trend. So I think it applies to real property writ large. All the new people, we have some amazing streets, 6th Street, 7th Street, Pacific Avenue. may not look great, but if historically that was a very vibrant retail corridor. So I think the the opportunity comes from what we're doing here. Obviously, it's sort of the rising tide is centered on the waterfront, but really the opportunities are in the immediately adjacent areas, which are still damn cheap by LA standards for sure. I think uh, what you said earlier is that I think it takes everything to make a, something come to life. So I know that historically, maybe the cruise ships didn't create much of a maybe income stream for the for the area, but there was nothing really to see, right? So if if now they come and there's an amazing center with a very walkable shopping district, there's multi, there's walkable retail, and there's a reason to stay, they're going to naturally walk it. You know, the moment somebody tweets about it or Instagrams about it, people will flock. And I think there's a lot of <clears throat> new people coming to the area because it's undervalued, because rents are cheaper than Long Beach, because rents are cheaper than LA, but there was nothing to do. Now you've got jobs, right? You've got university. You need housing. There's never enough housing, right? So you need affordable housing. So as much as this is a project that's going to look very pretty, uh, the rents comparatively to other parts of LA are less. So I think that if there's a job you can get, if there's an amphitheater you can go to, and there's a restaurant you can go to and eat, and you just can walk out of your place and get to it, you, they will come. So I know that you've been in this space, in this in this city for a very long time. We're newcomers, but we kind of are watching the, the this this city begin, or this section, I mean, it's LA, but this section beginning to thrive. And so when you're asking like, what's next? Another project like this. You know, obviously we, we're all focused on getting our projects to the finish line, getting it occupied, getting it finished, getting it, you know, getting it built. But once you create it, you're always looking for the next best thing. And I think, uh, but the most important part is also this, right? Having, making meaningful relationships with, uh, with new partners, new people. This isn't the first time we're com coming into an area that's on the rise. We've been to Hunter's Point in San Francisco. We've been to Inglewood, California, watching infrastructure come in, you know, stadiums being built. Or here, you've got the Harbor Project, you know? So uh, I think it's just, you know, navigating through whatever's out there, making friends, creating partnerships, and then the deal will just kind of miraculously land in your lap. How, how important are anchor projects to your decision making? Like a harbor, West Harbor, or like a SoFi Stadium? When I saw them break ground, I said, well, let's do this deal. That, that's the reality of it. Because we felt that, okay, there's something to do. Because <laughs> we've been scouting this area for seven years. I mean, we've lent here before, but we've never transacted. And always it was like, ah, it doesn't quite work. Ah, I could find a better deal somewhere else. But when everything lines up, you've got you guys breaking ground and you know what's happening because it's coming to life. It's, it's becoming real, right? They got tenants signed up. So if I believe that I would live here, then it makes sense to build it, you know? And so our, our whole team, you know, Ron, Shai, Lee, we've been putting our heads together. How do we do it? What do we do? What kind of units? Do we want some penthouses? No. Do we not? Maybe. So all of this collaboration, all of this thought, but the excitement comes from 
seeing it. You know, you could talk about it all you want. I mean, you, you guys have been at it since 2009. I mean, but we, I've heard this project coming to life for years. And I'm like, well, when is it going to happen? And seeing it break ground got me excited. And it's going to get other people excited. Like I said, if I would live here, then I would do the project. And I would definitely live here. And this is going to, they're going to have balconies. I mean, this is like, this is pretty pristine. But it, this is your unit? Okay, thing. three years from today, we're going to have an event in his unit. Um, all right, so, so this, is, um, this, is really, this has been really uh, interesting and, and fascinating. I think one, one thing also which, which I like personally is I like the walkability factor. Right, like I like to be able to potentially walk out my front door. Shaz, who's in the back, lives in Sino, with you know not far from me. And you know, you you, you can't, It's hard to walk down the hill, and you know, this is like walk out of your front door. You've got a whole, you know, you got parks, you got rec, you got you know innovation. You got you just everything is within uh a, in, in within a pedestrian lifestyle that I think we collectively strive for in L.A. but don't get enough of. Um, and so I think that there's certainly a sale point to that piece as well. Why don't we open it up to some questions? What, um, any final thoughts, by the way, before I do that? I don't want to, I know that there's we have a lot to say, history, you know, generations of knowledge. Anything you guys want to? I just think you really dressed well today. Thanks, buddy. You too, sweetie. Um, all right. So who wants to, uh, we'll open it up to some questions. Who, who wants to ask from someone on the panel something? While everyone's have a, thinking of their question, I'll just add one more thing to your last point about where the next kind of level of development or innovation might come. Um, at Alta C, we've got a 15-acre area across the street from our west campus that used to be oil tank farms. The tanks are gone. The port's going to clean up the soil, and we've got, we're have got we starting to develop plans for using that because uh, we know we're going to expand. The blue economy is going to expand, and so there'll be all kinds of new uses there. But I'd also point out the water itself. Right now, we have several of our most innovative tenants are on barges on the water on our wharf uh, because they need to access uh, seawater, for example. One or three of them are uh, experimenting with removing carbon dioxide from the ocean. You've probably all heard of direct air capture where we're trying to get carbon pollution out of the air. It's actually more efficient to take it out of the ocean. And in one case, the byproduct is green hydrogen. So you not only have another way to pay for the carbon removal, but you can get clean hydrogen into the maritime economy right here in the port for container handling equipment and other ways to clean up the air. So uh, I wouldn't overlook the, the water itself and the fact that more and more things can be floating on the water and serving the community. Can we get a microphone to Lee Williams? Is that possible? I'm going to put Lee on the spot for a second. He's a commissioner here at the port. And, um, oh, there's the mic there. Oh, perfect. Well, Lee um, and I had a, an interesting conversation. Lee, big, big real estate business, um, commissioner here at the port. What, give us the kind of three things on your mind that kind of that make this environment and this region so interesting to you. Great question. Three things. You know what? My, one of my favorite quotes is uh, from Warren Buffett, I'm greedy when others are fearful and fearful when others are greedy. San Pedro has a main corridor called Gaffey that um, when I first moved here, I've only been here 16 years. When I first moved here, no one would buy a home below Gaffey. We call this below Gaffey as we get closer to the water. And as Eric had pointed out, the closer you got to the water, the lower the property values, right? And that was because of three things. That was the Port of LA, really dirty place to, to operate, right? But since 05, we've seen a 80 to a low 90s um, percent reduction in the um, amount of, of pollutants. And we have a commitment to be completely zero emission by 2030 on the port. That means all the yard equipment is going to be electrified or hydrogen or some kind of alternate fuel that will be clean air. So that's, that's a major difference. We've already seen a huge improvement, like I said, between high 80s, low 90s percent improvement in the, the um, pollutants, but we're, we're not even close to being finished with that yet. So that, that's a big factor, right? And, the, and we were originally a whaling town, and then we built ships during the war, and then we were where Starkest first um, became a company. So all of those things are, are part of how it became a working class town, right? The second thing is the waterfront. We have 
the battleship Iowa, which is the f number four on TripAdvisor, places to go in LA. And people go to the battleship Iowa, 600,000 people, I think, a year go to battleship Iowa, and then they don't have a whole lot of other things to do other than to go to Long Beach or to the Hollywood sign or, or Disneyland or whatever. Our goal with the 220 cruise ships that we have coming in is when they get off the cruise ships, having some place to go. West Harbor is fixing that, is giving an opportunity for people to spend that half day, right? And then the third thing I think that is really um, important for people to know in investing here in San Pedro is we're working on an EIFD to um, uh, use tax dollars to improve the infrastructure here in San Pedro. And then we have a Jedi zone that's in the works right now between 1st and 14th Street on Pacific that's a, a really big deal. So we're getting people that are um, moving here because they want a place to live, work, and play. And we have all of those things coming together very nicely right now. And right. Yeah, and look, when people get off the cruise ship, if they want to go to Long Beach, I like Long Beach. It's a very, I think there's, it's a, it's very unique in a certain context. But if you're by the, by the water, and Eric and I were talking about this, I, I brought it up. He would never say anything bad about anybody. But you, you go to a, you go to a restaurant, and it's all the same restaurants you've ever seen. It's PF Chang's. It's this chain. It's that chain. It's, and what I really appreciate and respect about what's being built here at the harbor is. They're curated restaurants. It's going to be unique. They're going to be localized. Another restaurant you might see in San Diego. or So I think that there's going to be a more curated, you talk about this word curated, experience for folks that do get off that ship and don't need to actually travel across the bridge. They can stop right here and 100%. do something interesting. Yeah. I, I also wanted to mention, I'm sorry, um, I'm super excited about West Harbor. The 6,200-seat amphitheater is my favorite thing to do here in San Pedro or going to be my favorite thing to do. But the thing I'm by far most excited about in San Pedro is what's happening at Alta Sea. I think West Harbor can change LA. Alta Sea is going to change the world. And we're going to be the epicenter for a lot of thought leaders. We're going to be the epicenter for a lot of companies that are going to um, help invent new industries around the blue economy. And all of that is going to change the face of San Pedro because of the level of talent that's going to move here. Awesome. Thank you, Lee. You sure? Yeah. <laughs> Hi, my name's Mark Berger, and I've invested with uh, Lee and with Shai over here in San Pedro. And um, my elephant in the room question is the projects, which are down there, and also transportation. I came in from Calabasas today. Um, I got my passport, got in here. Uh, and uh, those are two issues. I've heard for years about the projects. Can anyone here, including Lee, or any of you up there, uh, what are the plans? Because, I mean, for me, that was an issue when I was investing. Everything turned out great, but I, but I know their plans. And the other issue is, it's so hard to get down here from anywhere in LA, anywhere in the valley. And if you're building a big amphitheater over here, you're going to want those people coming in. Are there any plans for trains, for any other type of transportation? Um, the, uh, so the, the projects here is called Rancho San Pedro. Um, the new project is called One San Pedro. There's 478 units there currently. They were built for workforce housing. Some of them have a foot thick walls. Um, they're not really conducive to Wi-Fi. They're not really conducive to urban living. They're, um, they're way outdated, and they need to be torn down and, and reinvigorated. The plan is to put in mixed income housing, um, probably in the 1300 to 1500 range, which is great because a lot of those folks are going to be folks that work at West Harbor. Like I said, people that live in San Pedro hate to leave San Pedro. And so being able to live, work, and play close to home and not be part of the traffic um, problem is, is going to be huge. So those, the timeline on that is we're probably looking at breaking ground soon. The, the goal for them is to um, build sort of like a hopscotch. So they're going to knock down the first building, build on that space, 
move people one time from other buildings into that space so that folks that live there only have to move once. And so they're going to double the number of affordable housing units, but they're also adding um, market rate units. And they're also going to add a component of affordable purchase units and market rate purchase units to that project as well. Um, it, the whole project's probably going to be 15 years, but um, it's well on its way probably within the next 12 months, you'll see something big. I mean, there, you know, that, that has been a challenge obviously for a whole lot of years. Um, Thanks, Michael. Getting, getting, uh, just because the density isn't such that, you know, getting from LAX down, you know, they, they are talking to put a metro stop in Torrance, which is, you know, 20 minutes from here. We do have the silver line down, but I'll say that is, you know, uh, in the works and much discussed. I don't think they've really had much of a, anything has been really decided beyond that. You know, we do have the 110 that dumps you right here. Um, and with the, what I like to think is the most LA thing in the world, with a fast pass, you can drive in the carpool lane alone. So I think that, you know, that, that is just speaks to volumes about Los Angeles. Pay the play. I, I like it all. I like it a lot. Um, I do want to just add, and one other thing, and, and I think which is really transformational, because we talked about it and Lee touched on it. You know, we had shipbuilding, we had the canneries, we had all these big heavy industries here. And I think at one time at the peak, there were like 116,000 uh, people came to work on the waterfront in Los Angeles. And now it's down to about 16. You know, these, these jobs are kind of from automation and, and moving other places. They've really shrunk. And so we, we became sort of this bedroom community. And now I think this is, there's some economic changes, um, more people working at home. We get a lot of West Siders moving in. In fact, that's one of the things San Pedro's love to complain about is all the West Siders moving in, the, you know, they're going to ruin the place or something like that. And frankly, I'm, I'm okay with it, West Siders, if there's West Siders in the room. <laughs> but the other side is what Terry's doing over at Altasea and, and Jenny and, and Jade and all the, all the folks there is because they're creating jobs, high-paying, good jobs, so that it, it's, it's kind of a symbolic thing. But there's other opportunities. There, there is, you know, one time SpaceX was going to take where the old Bethlehem Steel thing is. Some other high tech company is going to do some things. We have land around here. We have opportunities. And I think it's just the, the tip of the iceberg. And so you're going to see when the, when the world's focusing on, you know, we just had a big tourism event here. And they wanted to do a big event in San Pedro, the annual IPW event. And so it's like this is our, this is really our moment in the sun. And, you know, we've been down here 40 years, as Eric said, and, and for about 32 of those years, nothing happened. There was no investment. It was just like, uh, and then all of a sudden now we're drinking out of a fire hose. So thank you. And thank you guys for coming down. This is em emblematic of that, too. Awesome. Thanks. Ed. I'll tackle it. So I, I think uh, some, of the, some, of the, some of it doesn't matter. Because I think if you look at just fundamentals and you see that the occupancy rate for a multifamily here is 97%. Uh, we've scoured the, the comparables and they come, they work out of the house, right? And now with uh, post COVID, like what you mentioned earlier, people don't need office. So we're converting office into apartments. Uh, the secondary piece about, you know, social impact development and being able to revitalize areas, those things are happening. There's a lot of, uh, funds out there that are attacking, uh, those issues and creating better housing and, you know, you know, Ron and I have been a, a HUD lender. We, we understand the market rate development. We understand low-income housing development, tax credits. Uh, there's always ways to make a, a, a city come to life. I think the reality, and we've said this kind of in, in a loop, but fundamentals are here. People will come. They don't need to come from far away. When I drive to downtown, it takes me one hour, 30 minutes in the morning. It took me one hour, 30 minutes to get here. There is no easy way to commute in Los Angeles. Uh, the traffic or transportation problem is a Los Angeles issue. It's not necessarily a San Pedro issue, at least in my opinion. And I think that if there's enough things to do around here and it's affordable, there's a lack of affordable housing, people will move in and start doing things in the city. And you guys are building it. We're building it. Alta C is building it. So I think that when you create kind of an incubator for dialogue, when you create an incubator for people to do things in a particular city, you don't need to go anywhere else. You don't need to commute in. You just need to move in and then use it. 
put it back. Sheree Franklin with Urban Design Center and Housing Impact Partners. Uh, I've been a part of the San Pedro community for a while. Work with Ms. Hi, Alan. <laughs> um, uh, on the building the Harbor uh, City Harbor Gateway Boys and Girls Club, and now with Mike Lansing on all the boy, Boys and Girls Clubs here, and uh, as well as with Altice, uh being a, a thought leader with you as well. And um, I, the the thing that uh, weaves through all of that are the kids, are the the training of people, the jobs. Uh, it seems like a lot of talent is going to come out of what you're doing. How can we create a pathway? I know Altice is doing it with the universities, but across the board for translating uh, to job creation, our workforce centers, our young people, and uh, making sure that this is an, a microcosm of human capital and also investment capital. You mentioned what Altice is doing. I'll just use that as an example and then let my fellow panelists here comment as well. But uh, one of our trustees set us the challenge of making Altice the greatest field trip in California. And uh, he's sitting right here. And we're trying to do exactly that. So our K through 12 field trips really are incredible. Uh, bring kids in. They actually get to operate underwater robots. They get to look at kelp and algae under a microscope and understand what you can extract from it. It's just really a, an exciting, invigorating thing. They come in, you know, typical school, stu school students, sleepy and, and bored, and they go out just energized and buzzing. And then hopefully for many of them, that leads to career training. And we work with 13 community colleges on these certificate programs. So you can come out of high school and for 18 months, go to a community college and come out with a certificate in aquaculture that gets you a good job in these new aquaculture technologies. Uh, we're working on one for marine energy that'll include hydrogen and other alternative energy sources for the marine economy and another one on underwater robotics and more to come. So that's a great way to get the kids who are here today into those jobs that will also be here. And that's the important piece is to make this, uh, you know, one community where you live, work and play, as uh, my colleagues here have said. Hi, Phil Larman of OVP Development. Um, I actually lived in Long Beach for 13 years and I'm embarrassed to say that I hadn't made it over to San Pedro until about three weeks ago. So I met, uh, met up with Joe Buschioni and he took me to the Italian restaurant and it was fantastic. So if anyone hasn't tried it, you know, try it. Um, so my question is, you know, we're activating about $500 million of capital over the next five years, uh, primarily in multifamily. Is there room for additional multifamily down here? Is there room for additional affordable housing down here? Um, and from a commute standpoint, I came from West Hollywood down here. It was not that bad. Um, I think it's not as bad as people think it is. Granted, you know, depending on when you leave. Um, so that's one question. And uh, another is a comment. Terry, I think what you're doing is fantastic. We did something very similar in Youngstown, Ohio, in the manufacturing space uh, with America Makes. And it was very successful. So uh, excited for you. And uh, Emil and Eric, uh, excited for you guys as well. Uh, this is a, a game changer down here. Uh, for things to do. Um, and again, I'm, I am embarrassed I haven't come over here before, but uh, I can see uh, how it can thrive with this, the smaller kind of community effect and then let that, uh, you know, uh, amplify out to the community and welcome others uh, and get them to feel that, that community welcome. So, uh, yeah, is there room for more uh, multifamily and uh, affordable housing? There's a moratorium on new developers coming to the area. So, sorry. <laughs> But old developers who are already here. Right. We were the last Grand, one in. We like slid under the radar. It was yeah. an accident. Grandfather. Well, there's, uh, as, Lee, as Lee mentioned to me earlier, there's, there's a 8,500 unit need uh, and only 1,500 on, on plans. So certainly, I, I believe, not a developer here, but just from what I've learned is that there's, there's certainly more opportunity. Yeah, I, mean, I, th I think we agree. We're somewhat self-interested in having a couple assemblages that have, have and will remain earmarked for multifamily. But given that we're a family business, we can really just do one big project at a time. Uh, no, I think there's a tremendous amount of upside potential, to be really honest. I think as folks truly come to understand how nice a place to live this is, you know, 
the proximity to like White's Point, the, we're wrapped in ocean, we're adjacent to Palos Verdes. Um, you know, it's always had a little cloud because it's been kind of harsh and dirty and not the best of reputations. Um, but I think as we look to our target demographic, which is, you know, millennial and younger, sorry, those of us who are older, um, you know, gritty and authentic is not a turnoff. It's actually something to be embraced. And we're one of the larger landlords on uh, retail landlords on Sixth Street. And it's already a really cool, vibrant downtown. It, it wasn't that way 10, 15 years ago. Uh, actually, thanks in, to a very great extent to my brother, who I don't usually compliment unless I'm in front of a bunch of other people. But <laughs> he, he helped found uh, First Thursdays. So I would encourage anybody who's really sussing out the community from an investment standpoint is, well, one, if you can get a tour of San Pedro with my brother, you'll, you'll walk away with, he's something of a historian. We're all tired of hearing it, but you're not. Um, you, you'll come away with a, a different, with a sense of really how robust and unique it is and how varied it is. Um, and first Thursdays are packed, food trucks everywhere, people on the streets, fedoras and skinny jeans, stuff you didn't see here before that. Um, so, I, I mean, we're really bullish on San Pedro. Um, you know, we were wrong for a long period of time, and now it's looking like those investments are really, you know, frankly paying off. And it takes, takes patience and people who really are willing to work with a community to make the kind of changes that have been made. And uh, I think the market force is really around available housing and the cost of the housing here versus how cool the place is to live. I think if, I don't know what metric that is, should come up with it, but I think we'd be at the top of the list. Awesome. Appreciate everybody being here, asking really smart questions and these gentlemen for um, being here as well and having such incredibly thoughtful things to say about what's happening here. And thank you for all you're doing for the community um, and what you're building here in LA. It's really special. So